So the bipolar junction transistor in active mode is most useful in amplifiers, but also useful in modeling delay in bipolar junction transistor logic. The bipolar junction transistor in saturation and cutoff is very useful in representing steady states in BGT gates. So in saturation, a BGT is going to have two junctions that are on and forward, the base emitter junction and the base collector junction. So one thing that is actually kind of confusing is to think about the base emitter and collector as uh, forward junctions, and then to think of current flowing from the base into both the collector and the emitter because you have a forward junction. Uh, this way of looking at saturation is confusing and is wrong. A bipolar junction transistor in saturation is a lot more than just that. So let's see what, what's happening here. What's happening here is that the base emitter junction is on, which allows a lot of electrons to flow from the emitter into the base. The base collector junction is also on and the collector is n-type, so this allows electrons to diffuse from the collector into the base. The base is also going to push holes into the collector and holes into the emitter. As we talked about in the active uh, mode of operation, the holes that the base pushes into the emitter are much less than the electrons that the emitter pushes into the uh, base. Uh, in the case of the collector, perhaps there's more symmetry because the collector is not heavily doped. But what's happening here is that everybody is pushing electrons into the base, while the base is trying to push holes into everybody. So this basically floods the base with electrons. It floods the base with electrons from both sides. In the active region, the base collector junction was cut off, was, re was reverse. And so we did have a lot of excess electrons at the base emitter junction, but this dropped really precipitously until we reached basically equilibrium levels at the base collector junction. In this case, this is not going to happen because the base collector junction is not reverse biased. And therefore, there's nothing pushing electrons down to equilibrium levels at the collector. And so if we look at the distribution of electrons within the base, we find that we have a high level, definitely higher than the uh, equilibrium level, and also a high level at the collector base junction because this is also a forward junction. So. What we drew here shows that the uh, concentration of electrons at the emitter is higher than the concentration of electrons at the collector. They're both still high, but it's, uh, it's good to draw it this way. It's good to draw it as a trapezium with the larger side being at the emitter because the emitter is more heavily doped. So this is going to be NP0 e to the power of QVBE um, over, K, uh, uh, over KT, and this is going to be NP0 e to the power of Q V B C over K T. Both are forward biased, but we are going to see slightly, or not slightly, we're going to see smaller concentration on the collector side. Again, when we compare this to the uh, equilibrium level, it really doesn't matter because the equilibrium level is much smaller than both levels. So what has this done? It has caused the base to be rich in electrons. It has caused the base to basically be um, reverse its type. Now it's not p-type, it's n-type instead of p-type because it has a lot more electrons than normal, than usual. So what kind of, of material do we observe between the collector and the base? If we want to model what's happening here between the collector and the base, what kind of material do we see? So between the collector and the emitter, we see n-type and then n-type. So we see a continuous range of n-type, n-type in the emitter, n-type in the base, and n-type in the collector. So it's all n-type silicon. So what we are seeing is basically uh, some sort of semiconductor resistance. And in fact, the resistance here is very small. This is the smallest resistance you will see between the collector and the emitter. And so this is very useful when we want the bipolar junction transistor to work as an on switch because we are basically giving it the smallest on resistance, essentially zero resistance between collector and emitter if we are going to be um, approximating. So we are seeing a resistance between the two 
uh, between the two terminals. In fact, the best way to model the transistor in saturation is to model it as two voltage drops. So there's a voltage drop of about 0.7 volt representing VBE and another voltage drop of less than 0.7 volt, usually between 0.5 and 0.6 volts, representing VCE, VCB. So this is the uh, voltage drop between the base and the collector. So this leads to a, an overall drop between the collector and the emitter of about 0.1 to 0.2 volts. And this is the uh, most known model for representing uh, a bipolar junction transistor in saturation. So if you imagine that you have a BJT with its emitter grounded and its collector is at some voltage, and then you keep lowering the voltage of the collector, the voltage of the collector cannot go anything below, below this value, VCE set, which is why we call this transistor a transistor in saturation. What saturates here is VCE, the value of collector to emitter voltage. It's important to understand that saturation here is happening to voltage because when we talk about MOSFET, saturation will happen to current instead. There's one thing about uh, a bipolar junction transistor in saturation which is important to notice, which is that there is a lot of electron charge in the base now. So this amount of electron charge is going to be uh, is going to do two things. First of all, the difference between the level at the collector and the level at the emitter is the amount of electrons that manage to uh, recombine within the base, which is going to give us the base current. But also the amount of charge that this is not lost in the middle is an amount of charge that is stored within the base. So this is the total amount of charge stored in the base of the BJT when it is in saturation. If we need to move the BJT out of saturation, we first have to get rid of this excess stored charge within the base. So we have to give time for this excess electrons in the base to disappear. So let's just assume that we remove the voltages that cause the uh, forward bias on the two junctions. What's going to happen is that the base is now suffering from excess electrons and it wants to go back to its P type again. It's going to do that by recombining with the excess electrons and that's going to take some time. So this time for recombining the excess electrons in the base is something that affects the speed of BJT gates. Now, if the bipolar junction transistor has both junctions in reverse, which is going to happen, for example, when you connect the base to a small voltage, like ground, what's going to happen in this case is that the base collector junction and the base emitter junction are both going to be reverse. There are no buts, ifs, and else's here because we will have open circuits in both directions and there will be no collector to emitter current. It's going to be zero in all cases. So in saturation, we model the BJT as two battery drops and in cutoff, which is this region, when we have reverse bias on both junctions, we represent or model the BJT as an open circuit. So how do we model the BJT when it is an active region? So in active region, the BJT is going to have a forward biased PN junction on the base emitter junction. The, as we saw with the forward biased PN junction, it can have only a finite drop when it is forward. This finite drop, VBE, is going to be around 0.6 to 0.7 volts. And so we will represent it or model it with a finite battery drop of 0.7 volts between the base and the emitter. And then there will be a current flowing through the collector. And this current is going to be approximately equal to I0 e to the power of QVBE by KT, where I0 is a reverse saturation current that we can find from the expression of uh, the emitter current and the base current that we obtained in previous videos.